there's actually an interesting like last week I started with the the variety article going over Marvel's uh, Studios issues and kind of gave my thoughts as I read through it. Uh, and now, uh, we were going to talk about it during the Phantom Initiative, and then it never did happen. But Forbes did an article. Dane brought it to my attention. So maybe we'll cover it next week. But I was thinking I could go ahead and go over it now. And what's really cool about this article here, let's see if I have it set up on here. Yes. Uh, they essentially did an article response, and... They actually have an audio thing. It's an AI voice, but um, at least I can listen to it and give my thoughts as it comes up. I haven't read this yet, but apparently this is a this is an editor. Mark Hughes did a editorial uh, response to Variety's Marvel article, and we can we can see what the the takes are on there. Here we go. Let's let's try out this wonky AI voice. Marvel Studios woes are overstated. By Mark Hughes. Entertainment press are singing the woes of Marvel Studios, after a variety story that framed the studio's box office, streaming and casting issues as major problems threatening the studio's sustainability and sense of how to respond to changing theatrical and streaming environments. But the reality is Marvel's woes are overstated, in a media environment increasingly prone to hyperbole. True, true. That's an excellent That's point. not to say Marvel, along with all oh. studios and streamers, doesn't face some... Ah, okay. That, that might be an issue there. But yeah, um, the media's, uh, media right now is very hyperbolic, and they're all willing to jump on stuff. And I think something to absolutely keep in mind when it comes to Variety is Variety is access media. And that means everything in that Variety article is something that Marvel Disney is fine with having out there. Which is, uh, it's something to consider. Like, part of me even wonders if maybe, like, if you we went over that whole thing, you can go through the video. But like the conclusion of that variety article was like, "Hey, Marvel Studios is a bit down, but like if anybody can fix it and make it better, it's Kevin Feige." So let's see what happens. And so it was overall a positive article. That being said, there was lots of little tidbits in that article that that uh, obvious YouTubers could take and run with, which they have, and we can go over some of that as we go. Uh, and it also, it kind of made me wonder if maybe, like, listen, they aren't getting a whole lot of press right now if the actor's out, not out there promoting stuff. So was it kind of Marvel just kind of putting some stuff out there? See if they get, you know, the chuds to go after it, get some press that way? I mean, there is the the classic no press is bad press, which depends, but, uh, yeah. These are, this is nothing I can prove. It just... There are things that I wonder. Anyways. Some hurdles going forward. But the nature of those obstacles for Marvel are frankly pretty obvious. It's mostly things Marvel has overcome before. And regardless of those issues and the need to address them, Marvel is still actually doing pretty good right now even amid the problems they've had. So let's just unpack what's really going wrong, and what it means for Marvel Studios. The situation with actor Jonathan Majors, the star of several Marvel films and streaming shows, as the MCU's time-traveling villain Kong the Conqueror, is that he faces Kong. multiple accusations of abuse, and is scheduled to stand trial for one recent case. After that case was initially reported, other accusations surfaced, as did previous public statements from years ago by performers who asserted accusations of abuse were already circulating about majors. So yes, Mar Marvel has the choice to recast Kong. Lucky for Marvel, the character literally exists across a near-infinite number of alternate realities where he takes different forms and changes appearance. Likewise, Marvel has had to recast characters in the past, just like lots of other franchise or TV, streaming series. This isn't brain surgery, and the framing of this issue is something that could sink Marvel's whole future plans is frankly nonsense. Good point. Very good point. Just one great example. Marvel could offer the role to John Boy. Like, uh, yeah, so, like, they, they've recast, they, right, Terrence Howard was, uh, Rhodey, and then they recast him to John, Don Cheadle, who was actually their original pick, and since they started having issues with, uh, Terrence Howard, they, they got him, and it was, frankly, an upgrade, in my opinion. Don Cheadle's great. I like Terrence Howard, but Don Cheadle's better, in my opinion. Just saying. 
Um, but they've done that numerous times. People have gotten recast in Marvel, and it's not a huge deal. So the idea of Kang getting recast being a big deal seems overstated. I think I've said that before. And like I said, No Way Home even established that um, not all variants look exactly the same. Anyways. Yega, who I'd argue should have been the top candidate for the role in the first place. Or maybe Denzel Washington is an iteration of Kong Ooh. who sat out the infighting and collective efforts of the rest of the Kangs and grew older and wild. Oh my god. Could you imagine Denzel Washington jumping in as Kang? Oh my god. Like, I think Jonathan Majors is doing a good job, but Jesus Christ. That would be amazing, frankly. <laughs> oh my shit. <laughs> um... I, I just like that idea. <laughs> Kaiser as he made his plans to take over. Or maybe Ray Fisher could be offered the role. If Marvel wants to poke DC and WBD while scoring a great casting option. Nah, that's nah, not bad. Idea. Or perhaps Marvel could offer the role to Leslie Odom Jr., Lakeith Stanfield, O'Shea Jackson Jr., David Diggs, Stephen James, or any number of other fantastic casting choices to take over the role of Kong in the MCU. The point is, the worst part of... The question is, why is it pronouncing it Kong when it's K-A? I, I, AI is so dumb sometimes, I swear. <laughs> the situation with John Majors is if the allegations are true and women suffered this abuse while Hollywood ignored it. The casting problem is small potatoes by comparison and is easy to solve. So let's look at the financials now. Since a central claim to the Marvel is in trouble narrative is that the studio is struggling at the box office while streaming is an unpopular mess. At the box office, it's true Marvel hit a high point with its back-to-back -back releases of the two-part Avengers conclusion to the Infinity Saga. The $2.79 billion from Endgame... I imagine this is where they're going to go with this, but yeah, like, so, yeah, Infinity War and Endgame were huge. Marvel was not expecting to repeat that with every movie coming out after that. That's just not realistic. It's not tenable. That, that's an insane standard. Eh. Aim and $2 billion from Infinity War elevated the final global gross for all 22 films in that saga to more than $20 billion, for a per film average of around $935 million. In 2018 and 2019, the MCU put up the following numbers. Black Panther hit... Oh, they're going to do the average. I I actually did that already. I don't know if I saw that chart. Let me see if I can dig up that chart. Or I dig up per film average and actually even uh, separate out Avengers movies because they're... Because, yeah, that shows that it, Phase 4 is not bad. Like, Phase 4 is kind of on track with the other ones. Um, what, what would hurt Phase 4 the most is the fact they're costing more. That hurts them, but like actually bringing in the money it's doing fine um so this is uh when i did the calculations um so what uh per movie average in phase one was just under half a billion um without the avengers it's 300 uh uh 300 million and phase is that phase no it's phase three so phase two um, per movie average was, uh, just around 700 million, and without Avengers was 600 million, and then phase three, the per movie average was 1 billion, and without the Avengers was some, 775 million, and then phase four, I don't even think I, eh, it looks fairly up to date, phase four, uh, the per movie average, there's no Avengers movies in phase four. So the per movie average was 600 million per, that's how much each movie brought in um, after approximate cost, which puts it pretty much in line. It's significantly better than phase one, probably pretty much in line with phase two. So like, it's it's not the big bomb they, they like to make it out to be. Anyways, like, but uh, that's probably what the article is going to get to, but let's see. At $1.34 billion. Then Infinity War topped $2 billion. Then Captain Marvel scored $1.1 billion. And then Endgame took $2.79 billion. Ant-Man and the Wasp at $622 is the only MCU film in those 24 months that failed to top $1 billion. 
Since yeah. the Infinity Saga ended, Marvel's releases have taken north of $8.1 billion across 10 movies so far, with a multiverse saga per film average of about $815 million. The difference between $815 million and $935 million is not insignificant, but nor is it disastrous, and it's certainly not hard to understand why it's happening. Yeah, absolutely. The 2018 and 2019 slates for the Infinity Saga benefited from a decade of buildup, and it was those last four, out of five total, blockbusters topping $1-2 billion each that provided the final heft and resulted in an even higher per film average. We are only in the first half of the multiverse saga to date, and so far we haven't had a single Avengers movie in this new saga. While as noted the Infinity Saga ended with a 1-2 Avengers punch good for more than $2 billion per film. Spider-Man. Far From Home technically is supposed to serve as the denouement. But the yeah, so um, I, I like that. Hedgehog's like, is this art articulate? Yeah. So like, if you ignore the fact that it's a crappy AI voice, uh, it, it is what it is. Um, the actual art article is actually like thoughtful and nuanced. Um, yeah, th this feels much more thought out than the, the Variety article. It really does. The post-Avengers status and fact of it setting up and leading directly into Multiverse Saga, and audiences perceiving Endgame as the capstone, which Marvel called it, muddies that technical status. It's also worth noting most critiques of Marvel tend to specifically point to Endgame as where Marvel supposedly lost the thread, and didn't have enough plans and controls in place. And then the fact of the COVID-19 pandemic alone accounts yes. for most of the rest of the downturn in Marvel Studios' average box office performance. Even during the COVID-19 pandemic, when films were flopping or going straight to streaming, PVOD, Marvel's three releases that performed badly, due to the global health crisis still managed to finish between $379.7 million on the lowest end and $432 million. That's better than the DCEU can perform even after theaters reopened and box office started its climb back towards something resembling normal, at least for the right films, since 2023 has been a roller coaster ride for theatrical. Yeah, no, this is a fantastic article Dane found. Um, we should definitely cover this on the next initiative. I am loving this article. This is very well thought out. And honestly, it's a lot of the stuff I've brought up before. It, it's just like, hey, you know, all, all these story. Yeah, occasionally there's shit that happens at Marvel. It's a movie studio. Shit happens. Um, but like, it's still one of the most profitable movie studios ever. Like, even if we separate it out from Disney, like Disney's huge. If we separate it out from Disney, it's still one of the most profitable uh, movie studios out there. Period. Ant-Man and the Wasp. Quantumania underperformed earlier this year and wound up the weakest performer of that franchise at $476 million. But Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3 scored blockbuster results with $845.5 million. Indeed, Volume 3 is currently the fourth highest grossing movie of 2023, both domestically and worldwide. And for the record, as disappointing as its box office was, 2023 has been so cruel to theatrical releases that Quantumania is still a top 10 box office performer. Yep, absolutely. We've seen one would be blockbuster tentpole after another face plant or otherwise disappoint. And often when a tentpole has managed a healthy box office performance it's at a more moderate level than expected or typically enjoyed by the given franchise and or its prior financial trajectory. Other than Barbie, the Super Mario Brothers movie, Oppenheimer, and Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3, nothing else truly put up top-tier results this year. Fast X topped $700 million, but his fourth film in a row from the series to suffer a decline from its predecessor's box office gross and the lowest box office for the franchise since 2011's Fast Five, so it's a mixed bag there. Yep. God, they're making Besides great that, points. Besides that, 2023 saw three films in the $500 minus 600 millions range, four in $400 millions territory, and a couple of $300 millions. The makeup of the top 10 this year looks like this. Barbie, the Super Mario Brothers movie, Oppenheimer, Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 3, Fast X, Spider-Man, Across the Spider-Verse, The Little Mermaid, Mission, Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part 1, Elemental, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. Notice, there are three Marvel superhero movies in the top ten. Yes, one of them underperformed, 
but the point is that it seems silly to talk as if audience are in any widespread or large-scale way turning away from superhero cinema, or that Marvel is somehow reeling from a downfall and have lost control. The Marvels is currently tracking toward a shockingly low debut this weekend. Jesus, I have so little to say. Like, I, I guess I've said a little bit here or there, but like, this is just really good. Jesus Christ, it's fantastic. With most projections pointing to a $130 to $150 million global opening. Without at least average holds, the film could struggle to get past $300 minus $400 million. I, I want to add, too, The Marvels is not getting great reviews. Um, I haven't seen it yet. I don't know if I'll see it this weekend or wait till next weekend. Because uh, if you've been paying attention to the podcast, I'm going to see Depeche Mode. So we're going to be covering them this weekend. I know I'm missing some algorithm gold by not covering Brie Larson, but I'm, I'm going to see Depeche Mode because fucking Depeche Mode is awesome. But, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I don't know when I'm going to see it, but I know uh, there's some reviewers that, um, I guess there, there, I guess I'll say there's reviewers that I don't always agree with, but I trust um, that are giving it pretty bad reviews. We will see. Um, like I said, I don't always agree with them, so maybe I will like it, but it's not a great sign. That's pretty much what I'm saying. But still, at the end of the day, it's like this article is pointing out like Marvel. Yeah, Marvel's not doing as well as it did before the pandemic. No one fucking is. Uh, that's, that's the point. <laughs> On the other hand, I think tracking has proven pretty unreliable these days. And I believe a significant part of these disappointing numbers is the fact a lot of people are confusing this film with being another new Disney Plus Marvel show, or think it is coming to Disney Plus as a film soon. There's also the general 2023 ongoing curse to consider. But regardless, the Marvels should have been a home-run sequel. While we can point to the unethical shenanigans and toxic behavior of fans and of certain organized hateful online voices obsessed with attacking women-driven movies or shows, if this film flops or underperforms rather than merely suffering a downward adjustment consistent with the genre overall, which would mean a box office for the Marvels in the $700 million range, I'd say, then it's entirely fair to call it a big stumble for the studio. The large-scale tainting of superhero cinema by the DCEU's overarching failure the past several years, eight films in a row across five years, all failing to reach $400 million and averaging in the roughly $250 million range, coinciding with the COVID-19 pandemic and theatrical downturn, coupled with a leveling off, not uncontrolled free fall or any other hyperbolic situation, of Marvel's must-see. Event status in the aftermath of their 11-year Infinity Saga's conclusion, and lack of any Avengers team-ups for four years and counting, yeah. has no doubt reduced the dominance of the superhero genre and audience's previous high-level anticipation. But that sort of... This is just a great article. I'm feeling like I'm doing a little bit of content stealing, but ah, well, fuck it. Um, it's a great fucking article. It needs to shout it out. Uh, Mark Hughes, dude, this is a great fucking article, dude. Great job, man. Of heightened event status is impossible for any franchise or genre to maintain, and no serious person expected the genre or any one studio's piece of it to be some perpetual, ever increasing profit machine. Neither Marvel nor the genre in general need to treat the usual ebb and flow of primacy in entertainment as if it's some major crisis threatening the existence and profitability of the studio or genre. That's just the natural clickbait mentality driving entertainment journalism. We should be able to report on and assess such situations without resort to exaggerated portrayals for melodramatic purposes, nor parrot claims from those with obvious incentives and ulterior motives behind any of that sort of hyperbolic claims. We know better. But that doesn't mean the profession behaves better, and so we get clickbait and studio drama delivered up like silly reality TV, and everyone pretends not to recognize it as the nonsense it usually is. Marvel has to recast a major lead actor, something we've seen plenty of times by studios and projects, including literally by Marvel themselves on more than one occasion. Marvel's first two films of 2023 grossed a combined $1.3 billion in box office. Even if the Marvels only does $700 million, or a bit more than half the box office of Captain Marvel, a vastly bigger drop than even the Ant-Man franchise experienced, then the MCU will still have grossed a total of about $2 billion for the 2023, and still maintain an average of about $802 million per film for the multiverse saga. 
If that figure sounds familiar, it's because it's barely under a range I mentioned earlier, $815 million, for the per film average for the MCU ever since the end of the Infinity Saga. Marvel settled back a bit from the high per film average of $935 million, and for four years we've consistently seen this same new average level of performance for their films. Again, not insignificant as a drop, but in context it's easier to understand and recognize as not a sudden emergency situation, and I suspect most studios would be happy if they could average north of $800 million per film on average every year. Absolutely And true. let's face it, once the latest Avengers movies hit the radar, we'll see the average per film gross go up during those years, just like always, and in the long run if the two scheduled Avengers movies play at the $2 billion level, that will actually result in an increase in the final average per film gross for the multiverse saga, just as those huge Avengers box office grosses at the end of Infinity Saga seriously raise the saga's per film average. This is all fairly predictable, within an obvious margin of error but not frankly too far of deviation, which doesn't negate the fact of the downturn in average performances, but rather puts it into less histrionic perspective as solvable problems for a still overwhelmingly successful studio that's seeing per film averages still far superior to what any other studio can claim. Jesus. On streaming, where audience trends and preferences have likewise evolved during the COVID-19 era, Marvel has spent heavily to build a library and attract viewers, and it's mostly worked well. Let's consider Marvel's place on TV and streaming, and how we got here. First we got the ABC broadcast series, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Agent Carter, and Inhumans. Want to take a moment to recall how did those all fare with audiences and critics? Then came... Uh... Real quick, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I think overall did okay. It didn't do... Like, it, it, the opening premiere numbers were really good, but, like, the audience definitely dipped off after a while. Agent Carter critically was really well regarded, but, like, it didn't really get an audience. I think it only lasted one... Two seasons. I think there was two seasons of Agent Carter. And then Inhumans was a flat-out bomb, period. Just on every level. Complete fucking collapse. Netflix's slate, with Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, The Defenders, and The Punisher. Half of those got mostly good or great reviews, a couple got mixed to negative reviews, and along the way different seasons of a given show had their ups and downs. Many fans and reviewers bemoaned the general lack of tie-in to the cinematic releases, a point that's amusing in light of how the same reviewers and fans completely reversed course a few years later to bemoan the fact the newer MCU shows often try to tie into the MCU. So next up are The Runaways and Cloak and Dagger, shows with younger casts and less direct connection to the rest of the MCU, but both were short-lived and appeared on two different streaming services. Which brings us to the MCU shows on Disney+, Plus overseen by Marvel Studios itself and consisting of WandaVision, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Loki, What If, Hawkeye, Moon Knight, Ms. Marvel, She-Hulk, Attorney at Law, and Secret Invasion. While The Falcon and the Winter Soldier in What If, received mixed reactions, WandaVision and Loki got generally good to great reviews, as did Hawkeye and Moon Knight. Ms. Marvel likewise received strong positive reviews, Aside from resentful fans mostly motivated by racism or sexism who bashed the show, the yeah. same way angry bigoted fans harassed Brie Larson and tried to manipulate online reviews for Captain Marvel, and to this day engage in bizarre conspiracy theories pretending movies with women leads are secretly propped up by studios buying up tickets, and the same mob of boys and men perpetually upset that everything isn't just a mirror reflecting themselves were incensed that she Hulk dared make fun of them for being immature, bigoted, and all-around goofy. Damn. Granted, She-Hulk did often have what looked like rushed and unfinished CGI, but it was also still miles ahead of most TV CGI and it didn't detract from the entertainment value of the show and was generally fine. Yes, plenty of folks just didn't enjoy these shows, and I'm sure it's entirely a coincidence that for many of them it always happens to be women-led shows that bother them or are declared, meh. <laughs> Secret Invasion is the most recent new MCU show, besides a new season of Loki, and it got mixed reviews that lean mostly positive but still point to trouble in the decision-making. Yeah, I'll go ahead and say it. Like, Secret Invasion had potential, but, uh, you know, Samuel Jackson, da, ta, uh, the Samuel Jackson, uh, Don Cheeto-led show. Such potential, and... Like, it wasn't, like, 
dreadfully bad, but mainly that finale was just, uh, it, it it felt not well thought out for something that really should be well thought out, frankly. To develop the series. The point of all of this is, Marvel's had a lot of superhero shows for a long time during the reign of the MCU, and the shows have tended to mostly get good or great reviews, while often suffering complaints of inconsistency in tie-ins versus standalone abilities, or if EVFX, or questions about who is in charge and why certain decisions were made. Sound familiar? It should, because it's a broken record of reality at this point, the sort that gets mentioned as if it's a new development anytime someone is pushing the latest version of the sky is falling narrative. True. <laughs> Not that there aren't issues needing solutions. The budgets are too high, and Marvel, like many streamers, yep. is discovering it's simply not sustainable to spend $20 million or more per episode with rushed production schedules and increasingly unreasonable demands on VFX workers. Yep. But the shows themselves are so far working and working pretty well, if you aren't focused entirely on social media debates and media exaggerations. Most every MCU show on Disney Plus has enjoyed positive reception from critics and viewers, enjoying good, and sometimes record-setting, viewership. Fixing the problems for the Marvel streaming plans is not really any more difficult than fixing the theatrical issues, because it's easy to identify the problems, easy to see where the problems arose, and easy to see what is necessary to end those problems. Nobody foresaw the COVID pandemic, or at least the extent of it, or the utterly shameful, failed public health response it elicited from governments and organizations that are paid and entrusted to prevent or deal with such crises. Marvel was caught off guard like every studio, Marvel suffered the same box office downturn as every studio, Marvel leaned into streaming like every studio, and Marvel is now having to make adjustments to adapt to the still-evolving environment theatrically and in streaming. So media and fans and others in Hollywood pretending this is some shocking, Marvel-specific situation are making disingenuous claims, and they should know better. Most probably do, but the truth is more boring than doomsaying, <laughs> and with everything else in the world falling apart, clickbait and hyperbole are the best way to get attention for entertainment news during a drought, caused by few new films, shows releasing, and the likelihood of strikes dragging into next year because studios put money toward bonuses, yachts. Well, uh, that, that got dated quickly, but... Yeah, we, we, we should probably see about covering the, the actors. I don't know if I'll have time to cover everything I want to cover today, but uh, we should probably try to find time to cover the resolution of the strike. <laughs> and private jets rather than pay artists, writers, and performers living wages from a fair share of the revenue they generate. Marvel will recast Kong. They'll reduce the number of shows and films in production at a given time. They'll get budgets under control and allow more time for VFX work and they'll refocus on the approaches and measures that worked so well in the past to determine which projects to greenlight and how to return to the sense of a big shared world the Avengers have to team up to save. Luckily, with the X-Men and Fantastic Four reboots around the corner, Marvel has a couple of big teams with lots of potential for precisely the sort of storytelling Marvel does best at the blockbuster level. They could even simply move toward a post-Secret Wars setup that lets Fantastic Four, X-Men, and a handful of other existing popular franchises carry the Marvel brand forward for a while. Yeah? We will also probably see the temporary return of Robert Downey Jr., Chris Evans, and Scarlett Johansson reprise their popular MCU roles for Avengers, the Kong Dynasty and or Avengers, Secret Wars. And looking at the upcoming slate, it's not hard to see there's plenty of reason to feel confident Marvel will continue to enjoy success, even if it's at a slightly moderated level due to the myriad factors we've discussed, including the idea that superhero genre films are settling into a more consistent long-term level of popularity and performance from now on. Yeah. The Jesus. next four years brings Deadpool 3, Captain America, Brave New World, Thunderbolts, Blade, Fantastic Four, Avengers, The Kong Dynasty, and Avengers, Secret Wars, and at some point thereafter Armor Wars and the X-Men. Of these films, the two Avengers movies are likely to be blockbuster hits, as is Deadpool 3. Captain America. Brave New World is an established franchise, lacking the original series lead but with a continuing cast and brand that I think are enough to avoid any significant downturn in box office, even if we see some drop from the peak levels of the Infinity Saga. Blade and Thunderbolts are the riskier property. I think it's worth noting, like, um, Winter Soldier 
and uh, first Avenger didn't light up the box office. Uh, Civil War did, but that 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 was almost like a junior Avengers movie. So of course that one did. So yeah, the idea of Brave New World matching something like Winter Soldier in the box office. Now quality wise, it might be it'll be tough to match because Winter Soldier is amazing. But uh, box office wise, Winter Soldier is very reachable for Brave New World. These here. But the former is a previously successful cinematic brand and the latter is a team-up movie including some recognizable characters and stars. Still, this is where we might see more under performances. Fantastic Four could likewise either perform at a blockbuster levels, or might wind up in the $700 million range, but as a key property getting lots of attention and must work oversight, I think it'll avoid being a problem. Armor Wars is an extension of the Iron Man movies, and possibly, probably coming after we see Robert Downey Jr. again in some Avengers action, should perform well, and X-Men is a known successful brand getting an MCU reboot and polish as a big team franchise including younger cast members, so I think it'll at least be capable of playing at the Guardians of the Galaxy level, if done right. This isn't a debacle, it's not doomsday, and Marvel isn't in disarray. The internal difficulties they've faced are frankly typical and easy to identify and solve, as much as everything else we've discussed here. The bottom line is this. We've seen Marvel Studios kick off with a big hit in Iron Man and an outright flop with the Incredible Hulk, yes. after which Captain America. The first Avenger and Thor performed at okay levels but didn't set the box office on fire by any stretch. We got the original Avengers movie off the strength of Iron Man and Iron Man 2, and to really help put this into perspective I'll point out the average per film box office of Phase 1 was $634 million. Phase 2's per film average was $876 million. Marvel worked hard to build what they created, and it's a tremendous historic success full of ups and downs that so far have ultimately maintained an impressive level of successful across a large slate of films and series. Even if they see a further decline in average per film returns, as long as they remain in the big blockbuster tier and can compete strongly even in years that are punishing most box office comers, Marvel will still be performing consistently better than other studios and have plenty of room to make the right, obvious adjustments, lowering budgets, giving more time to complete projects, and less oversaturation of their shows and films per year. To look at this history, this math, and think Marvel Studios is in deep trouble, struggling, or never really was very good to begin with, is unreasonable and contrary to the data and any serious considerations. Damn, that was a banger. Mark Hughes, you just got yourself... Oh, let me... I'm going to go ahead and uh, dig up his Twitter and give him a good old follow. Because that was a damn good article. This somebody actually fucking analyzing shit and going, Hey, um, Marvel is fine, guys. Just saying. Oh, okay, yeah, anyways, found, it, found, his, uh, found his Twitter... Gave him a follow. Looked like I found a tweet where he is breaking it down. I don't know why I capitalized must. Um, yes. That was excellent. Great article. Good job, Mark Hughes. I, I feel like I did a little bit of content stealing there because like most of what he's saying, I'm like, yep. Yep, that's correct. Books, records, films, these things matter. Call me shallow. It's the fucking truth.